Okay, I want to thank you all very much for inviting me here today. It was wonderful to meet the Rudds last night and get a chance to, to talk with them about what they're trying to do on both sides of the pond to um, really foster research and translation of research to practice in the area of adoption. Uh, I want to forgive the people at University of Massachusetts Amherst for stealing Hal from us. <laughs> But now that I see of how happy it is and what he's doing here, I will forgive you, but I'm not sure the rest of the University of Minnesota will, however. So it is really wonderful to be here today. Um, my task has been to, uh, to talk about post-institutionalized children, what we know about early deprivation. They are, in a sense, a model of the impact of early deprivation on human brain and behavioral development. We've been studying children adopted from institution in collaboration with other colleagues in the United States who have been studying children in the child welfare system. Um, and we find that many of the things that we see with children adopted from institutions are very consistent with what we see for children who have experienced significant neglect in their families of origin. In the United States. So we believe that this research on children adopted from orphanages has legs that it will help us understand and be able to hopefully intervene not only with those kids to help them become the greatest that they can be, but also to give us some ideas of what we might be able to do for families who are raising children who started their lives in the child welfare system or for those kids who are still in the child welfare system because they've experienced significant neglect and maltreatment in their families of origin. So without any more, let me tell you what we're going to do today. It's a lot. You should never give an academic an hour and a half. <laughs> we'll see how far we get. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a bit about how experience affects the developing brain. I'm bringing this information to you from a group that I work with called the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. This is the group that did the review of what we know about early brain development and produced a report that some of you might know called Neurons to Neighborhoods back in the year 2000. We've stayed together, we've continued to vet the science of what we really know about development and how that occurs and we've been working with a group of communications experts experts to try to package that into understandable chunks that we can deliver. Our goal is to deliver it to policymakers so that they can understand in their state legislatures why they should shift resources and help in early development. I'm going to use the same slides with you in the same simplifying model. So if I have oversimplified things, just know that you understand things in a more complex way than your legislature people do. <laughs> but hopefully it will work for both. Um, I'm then going to talk a bit about the sequelae of early institutional rearing on neurobehavioral functioning of post-institutionalized children prior to pu puberty. I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle here because you have Jen McDermott who could give this part of the talk as well or better than I could. But it's critically important if we think in developmental terms to understand what children are bringing to the teen years. Right, so we can't just drop down in adolescence. We need to understand how their functioning is uh, going before they reach those adolescent years. I'm then going to do a bit on the normative changes in neurobehavioral development that we see in typically developing adolescents who have not had early histories of neglect and deprivation. So this is a burgeoning new area of research, by the way. So. I mean, we don't know everything. This is like the hot area in developmental, affective, and cognitive neuroscience right now. We're going to have a little smidgen on the behavioral and emotional problems that we see arising in post-institutionalized youth as they hit adolescence. And then the meat of the thing, which is very brief, which is why I had to put all this stuff up in front of it, because we're just beginning this area, the emerging work on puberty and brain development in post-institutionalized youth. Before I start all of this, I need to really, really get the right frame on this. The glass is always, when you're studying children who have started their lives in deprivation and then have had opportunities to rebound by being placed in nurturing context, the glass is always always half empty and half full and it depends on the lens you take there. We also see it a tremendous spectrum of outcomes 
a tremendous spectrum of outcomes. The heterogeneity of outcomes is part of our challenge and what we have to explain. We talk about that in terms of some of these individuals seem to be resilient, at least in certain functions, to the experiences they've had early. I think one of our challenges in thinking about resilience is that Imagine if you were to measure the heights of everybody in this room and we were to put them on a scale. You would see a normal distribution, right? Some people would be shorter, some taller, everybody in the middle, it's called a bell-shaped curve. If on anything we measure on children who are adopted from conditions of deprivation also conforms to a bell-shaped curve. We don't see like one group that's doing fine and another group that's doing horrible. We see a shift in that bell-shaped curve. So one possibility is our resilient kids would have been even more amazing had they been able to start life in great circumstances and they were clipped a bit but still stay up in that range. I think that's true for some of the things we're looking at. I think for other things there are other processes going on but I want you to remember that we've got a huge range. I'm going to focus on changes in the mean or the median. Okay and it's going to be deficits, deficits, delays, delays, and it's going to sound really, really depressing. Okay, But it's not because we've got a full range and if we can understand what's going on, hopefully the goal is if we can understand the neural systems that have been impacted, we can more t in a more targeted way provide experiences to help rewire, to retrain the brain. That's the goal. That's the hope. So keep that in mind as we go through with everything today. Please. So how does experience affect brain development? In a nutshell, in 10 minutes or less. We know that genes are critically important for putting together a healthy, normal, developing brain. And for the individual differences, some of the individual's differences we see in how the brain functions. But we also know that it takes the right supportive experiences. Genes alone are not going to do it for you. It takes the right supportive experiences for the brain to be able to organize itself. And in fact, now we know that experiences, it's not only that genes and experience work together, we also know that experience now can actually write on your genes. It can actually change the way the genes you carry are functioning. It's an area called epigenetics and it is a powerful new tool for us to begin to understand how what happens to you early in life can have implications throughout your development even when circumstances change. We are also learning that at one time we thought this was permanent. Once you got this signature, it was permanent. We now know that it's not. There are instances where you can reprogram those genes, but we need to understand that's sort of the, the cutting edge of, of research on epigenetics. So let me give you a sense of what we're talking about. This is a child's brain a cartoon of said, and here's a neuron in a child's brain. Okay? We're all with me so far. Now, that's the nucleus of the neuron, and you all learned in high school biology that inside the nucleus is where your chromosomes lie, right? And on your chromosomes are these long strands of DNA. Part of that DNA, pieces of that DNA, are your genes. And genes are recipes to make a protein. So they're like your little cookbook for your protein. It's all the different proteins your body can make. On the genes, usually in the sort of the front part of the gene is an area that's called a promoter region. This is the area that has ways of interacting with information coming into the cell. And either turning on starting the events that turn on or turn off the transcription of that gene. Like a little guy who goes in there and copies the recipe down and takes it from the cookbook out to the cook that is going to make that protein. Okay? The promoter region. Where our early experience can leave ca lasting chemical signals on these genes, experience gets to the nucleus through various chemical pathways triggering regulatory proteins that get into the nucleus of the cell and attach to regions on that gene, often in the promoter region. In a way, 
often sort of gluing that promoter region shut so when signals come in they can't turn that gene on. There are other mechanisms as well but that kind of process. So it turns off, it silence the genes in that cell. Absolutely necessary for normal development guys. This is not a bad thing. Otherwise your heart and your liver would produce exactly the same proteins and you would have problems. Right, so it happens in a normal part of development. The amazing thing that's been learned is it continues to happen after birth and it is part of the system where experiences get in and bias the developing organism to respond to the environment in different ways. Okay? Much of this, but not all of it, is happening prenatally and we know that when we think about the development of children who have been adopted from difficult circumstances, we do not start at birth. We must start thinking about what has happened prior to birth. We are now learning that the placenta, this most magnificent, wondrous organ here, is not a barrier. It's more like a filter. It does keep out some things, but in many ways it also provides, some people have even talked about it as the baby's sense organ. It samples the environment and it brings information about how harsh or benign that world is to the baby through what nutrition the baby is receiving, the infections that might be getting to the baby, or maternal, chronic, and severe stress that changes the biochemistry of her body as she attempts to manage that, that also come in and filter and talk to the baby and seem to produce epigenetic changes in many regions of the child's body that shift it towards a baby that when it comes out will be better able to live in harsh conditions versus better adapted to benign conditions. Just a little bit. It's probably been part of our evolution for a long time because we can study this in many different animals. Then there are the teratogens, <laughs> the really bad stuff that were never meant to be there, the drugs and the alcohol that frankly cause just damage to the developing organism. If we look at the baby at birth, we see some of these evidences, lower birth weight, may well be a result of all these signals coming in. Lowering birth weight a little bit, shortening gestation, getting that baby out of there, giving the mom a better chance to survive, conditioning the whole, you know, harsh conditions. One of the challenges is that if you're not born into harsh conditions, but you are born into conditions of plenty or you shift into those conditions, you may be perfectly adapted for harshness. And now plenty and you gain weight rapidly and you actually get set up, we think, for problems with coronary heart disease and other kinds of things as you age. It's one of the hypotheses. It's called the fetal origin of adult disease. We now think this extends beyond the fetal period and we certainly see evidence of this who children who develop in institutional settings getting the same amount of food as what they would need. They grow more slowly their stress system is activated. When they get to their families, they grow like weeds. And now folks are beginning to look at whether they might be, we don't know this. This is a hypothesis. Do not walk away and I learned that. You, know, you didn't. You learned that people are curious about whether children like this may be at a slightly higher risk. Those who have been stunted in growth at adoption and grow really, really fast afterwards. Not getting porky or fat, but have this pattern. Whether some of their biology has shifted and maybe made them at a slightly higher risk for the development of insulin resistance and all those other things that happen to many of us. Raise your hand if you're on statins. Um, <laughs> as we age. Okay. And of course we know we have to worry about fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol exposure and so forth and so on. We have to put that into our picture of thinking about children who have come from difficult circumstances as they go through and now begin to enter the teen years. Experience literally shapes the architecture of the developing brain. What you're looking at here is a slice from the prefrontal cortex, not obviously of a living child but of a baby who has died. Some poor graduate student has sat there and looked at this under an electron microscope and carefully has drawn these. This is what it looks like at birth. The prefrontal part of your brain is involved in being able to do like things like arithmetic or plan a trip or all sorts of things that we ultimately call executive functions. Not things newborns are known for being able to do, right? Right. And if you notice and look at this, you'll see that none of these nerve cells are really talking to any other nerve cells. They're not sending information. 
And in order for a nerve cell to do anything, they have to connect at synapses and transmit information. It's not happening at birth in this part of the brain. But under genetic control, boom, voila, zap. At a certain point in development in this part of the brain, there will be an over proliferation of connections. Have nothing to do really with experience. It has to do with the gene saying, now it's time, connect everybody up. But connecting everybody up is not very efficient because if you try to do something you're, that it's spreading, I mean, you, you want efficient pathways. You get efficient pathways by using your brain. The brain becomes what the brain does. So the child who in this region, at these areas, is thinking about problems, who's working and solving problems, who's getting feedback that they're being effective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they are confirming pathways that will be very useful, and the ones that they don't use will fall away. And by about 14, 15 years, we have a much more efficient brain. It's not done yet, guys. This whole process in this part of the brain is going to go on till you're 20. And then after that, it's all over. Um, <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that once this is done, you can't form new pathways. But this is the brain's amazingly efficient way. Get everything connect up and then just confirm what works as opposed to forcing the connections. When we try to retrain a brain in some regions, we are probably working on developing new connections that aren't there. We can do it, but it often takes much more focused attention, stimulation, and more practice. So that's the front part of your brain. This whole genetic program works different times in different parts of the brain, which, no duh, kids develop skills at different times, right? So what comes on first? The child's ability to see, to focus, to use vision and audition. And when we look at the back part of the brain, we see that over-proliferation happening earlier and the pruning happening earlier. Next region, whoops, don't go backwards, go forwards, Megan. Then then regions that are involved in language and other uh, higher order thinking begin to develop and prune. And finally, those prefrontal regions I told you begin to develop and prune. What you're looking at, though, is the first three years is pretty darn critical for setting up many of the basic structures and functions of the developing brain. The brain has to be able to process information, has to be able to look at things, has to be able to listen to things, has to be able to reach out and touch things has to be able to do things in order to get itself wired up appropriately, the basic stuff. And the other thing is, although we talk about this region does that and that region does that, let me tell you, in any complicated task, the brain is working together. And so if you set up a poor sort of shaky foundation, it's hard to develop those skill sets that require later developing structures, they often are sort of a wob on a wobbly foundation. And things that we see starting as problems back here often end up in the brain looking like architectural problems in the prefrontal cortex as the brain develops. So experience matters for shaping the basic architecture of the human brain. It ain't over, ever. We can always retrain the brain. But the easy way of getting it well set up early begins to close off as we prune things and we have to go to a different mode of training the brain. So I hope I've convinced you that it takes stimulation to develop a healthy, normal architecture of the human brain. And then nature's cruel and amazing trick. The human organism is born less mature than most mammals on this planet. A human infant cannot roll over, cannot get its hand to its mouth, cannot lift its head off the pillow, has to look at what is right in front of its face, and even its vision isn't very good, so it has to be pretty close so that it becomes clear. Nada, nada, nada. Left to their own devices, babies cannot provide the stimulation they need to develop their brain. Rhesus monkeys are in much better shape because they can locomote from birth, they can crawl around, they can do stuff. Human infants are there. Except, human infants are known. Jen, does your child running your entire household now with every squeak and squawk? Where are you, Jen? She has an 11 week old? Where are you, Jen? Right there, right? Whole house is running by, baby's running the house, right? Absolutely. And that's because the human brain evolved to develop in the context of relationships. In the context of relationships, that baby is able to 
serve out information, I'm interested, I'm looking, and the world responds with stimulation. And be, through their interest, and they're crying when they're not interested, they drive stimulation. They're building their brain through the, in the context of relationships with parents, with grandparents, with brothers and sisters, and increasingly in development with other peers. They're building their brains through these relationships they have. Yes, you can act on the object world and begin to build the brain, but the amazing data, I mean, the, the human world is so much more resilient, responsive, varied, and it reacts, you know, you get tired of the toy, and until your parent figured out you're bored with this, that's all you got to play with, right? But a human realizes, because you're fussing, <laughs> that you're bored, and will change their behavior until they get their smile. We are, we're, our brains are made to develop in the context of relationships. And this is why we worry so much about children who develop under conditions of deprivation in orphanages or in families where they're significantly neglected and spend a lot of time without this kind of relationship back and forth because they don't have the information they need to begin to set up that structure. Earlier is better. The earlier you begin to get to that, presumably the better off you'll be able to. You've still got plasticity going. The later you get there, the more potential there is for the need to restructure some of that, to do some, something more than just provide normal stimulation. So this is what we've been looking at. Of course, one thing we know about kids is they are just amazingly adaptive. They'll turn to the sun. They'll find the stimulation that they need, if it is possibly there. And when they get to families, they gobble it up. And one of the most amazing things is to watch children who've come out of severe deprivation as they get to their families and follow them over that first year or two. They grow like weeds. The ones who have been uh, stunted because of their experiences will grow one to one and a half times the rate of kids their age and they'll start approaching what would be typical normal weight and height pretty darn fast. Whether or not that's Dana's talk, he can do it later. Motor development. Babies who haven't been crawling and they're 14, 15 months of age within you know a month or two months are walking. I mean, they just boom. Language development, if they're of the age, begins to come along very, very rapidly. Social development, too. We are finding they form attachments very quickly, even if they've never had an opportunity with any consistent caregiver. Social development is rapid, and most children who come out of conditions of deprivation within about two years post-adoption are operating within the normal range. But the normal range is large. It is a mean and one standard deviation. Within the normal range is 66% of the population. And we know from work like by the Bucharest Early Intervention Project looking at IQ, and this is very consistent also with the work Mike Rudder did in the United Kingdom, looking at children adopted from Romania into the UK, and very consistent with the findings of my own group. That yes, within, uh, actually we're finding within 12 months, most of the kids are within the normal range of IQ. But what that means is what you're seeing here is this box is the normal range for IQ, about up to 116 and down to about 76 points, okay? This, these data actually come from the group that were randomly assigned to go into foster care in the Bucharest project. They went in at different ages, not because they were more or less adoptable or easy to foster, but because that's when the money landed to be able to put them in the, uh, the foster care. And the foster care was not your average foster care, it was designed and run by the project. It was like Cadillacs of foster care. And what we see here is at 54 months of age, those who got into a supportive family, 7 to 18 months are within the normal range, 18 to 24 months are in the normal range, 20 to 30 months are less but in the normal range on average, 30 months plus, not quite, and actually as they follow these kids up they get a little better, but they've sort of found where they're going to be and now they'll be moving up. So timing matters, but amazing recovery, glass half full, half empty, right? This is the story that we're going to keep telling. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk through a bit of what we know about the, the impact or the sequelae of early institutional rearing on behavioral development. I say neurobehavioral, but this part really is more behavioral development of post-institutionalized kids 
prior to puberty. This is where most of our information is. The Bucharest projects, the kids are just getting to puberty. And they've got money now, so we'll see them. The Rudder Project, the kids are actually young adults, so they've seen those kids through the pubertal period. Um, my sample, I have a plenty of teenagers, but I'm only getting to the teenage questions. I've decided to focus this part of the talk, though, on those skills and capabilities that may be critical to kids as they move into the adolescent years so that they can be successful as adolescents. So we're going to talk about the social cognitive skills that underlie social competence. The teen years are a crucible of being able to negotiate the social world. It gets really complicated, especially if you're a girl. But there's other complications, I guess, if you're a boy, which means dealing with girls. Uh, <laughs> because as my son said, I don't get it, you know? I watch them, they do all these mean things to each other, but they, you know, if we get upset, we just have a fight and it's done. And they're doing all, I mean, how do you relate to a girlfriend who's telling you all this stuff? I mean, I don't get it. Okay, so they gotta get socially competent too. We're gonna talk about emotional responses, anger and fear, because regulating your emotions in heated, very heated sometimes, peer relations in adolescence, highly critical to your success. And a new area that um, we're getting interested in, and you know, half the rest of the neurobio world is getting interested in, is understanding risk taking and sensitivity to reward signals. Um, and we're going to look at that prior to adolescence and then what that may do during adolescence. So let me just start chugging away here. Is this the level of information that you all are hoping for? Have I overshot, undershot? Okay, no one's asleep back there, so that's good. Okay, so let's talk about social competence. Parents tell us that children adopted from conditions of deprivation often struggle being as socially competent as their peers. Now I want to make it clear here that I'm not necessarily talking about popularity. I'm not necessarily talking about whether other kids like the child. Some of these children are just such sweet, lovely individuals that other kids really like them, even though their social skills aren't really that good. So social skills and competence, and whether other people like you, they're related, but they're not perfect. Some of our most socially skilled kids use it in a way that drives other kids away, right? To be socially cruel and do it well takes having a lot of social skills. It doesn't mean other kids are going to like you, though they may fear you, OK? So social skills and competence and popularity being liked and being happy with other kids are a little bit different things, so don't get them mixed up. So what are the building blocks of social competence? There are quite a few, but I'm going to stick to these. Reading and understanding emotions in others. Okay? It's actually a complicated thing to do. Peak emotions are pretty easy to identify, but we often see blends. There are mixtures of emotions. As adults, some of us are really good. We're called clinicians, I'm not one, uh, at reading the emotions in others' faces and body gestures. Others are a little more clueless. They're called physicists. <laughs> I'm married to one. Um, so there's a normal range of this. It's not like we all get to be perfectly adapted on this. There's a range and we'll talk about that. Perspective taking, being able to not only, we talk about putting yourselves in another person's shoes, but it's not the shoes we really care about, it's putting ourselves in the other person's mind. Which means that we have to understand that other people have minds, that we have a mind, that their mind is different than our mind, that they may be thinking different things than we thinking, that they may be thinking about us thinking about them thinking about us, okay? Complicated stuff, um, and we'll talk about that. Understanding and appropriately negotiating the social boundaries and intimacy rules. This takes, first of all, identifying other people as appropriate in intimates versus people I don't know, right? Step one. Babies get to this early in development when they start developing wariness of strangers. They clearly show, they know these are my people, you're not one of my people. You might be a nice people, in which case I'll hide behind mom's leg and be coy and smile at you, right? But you're not my people. So they get that early. Once they've gotten that, 
they develop an understanding of what the rules are within our culture about how you treat intimates versus how you treat strangers. Cultures differ in how close you stand when you talk to someone you don't know, right? We have cultural variations in that. So you have to know when to use those, you have to know what the cultural rules are, and you have to use them appropriately, right? Because there's nothing wrong about holding hands, hugging, kissing people, telling them your deepest, most inmost thought. Perfectly appropriate, we do that with intimates. So it's not the behavior that's wrong, it's you have to learn when to use that behavior. And that, for those of you who understand this thing called executive functions, sounds a load like executive function. We have to use our executive abilities to know when to engage in behaviors, and we have to be able to identify the, the cues that tell us. So understanding and appropriately negotiating social boundaries, and then the ability to regulate our emotions and our behaviors. So you might understand, but unless you can regulate, you got a problem too. Okay, so reading and understanding emotions in ourselves and others. Surprisingly long development of oppression to a true adult competency. We can take kids, normally developing kids, lots of, you know, not deprived at all, they're 13 years of age, 14 years of age, you show them pictures of emotional expressions, and they're still having a little trouble telling. So without any other cues, like the context or you know movement or anything, telling the difference between some of the negative emotions. Surprise and fear are sort of close. We can get those mixed up. Sadness and, you know, so the negative emotions, well, we can tell happy easy. Happy is easy. Everybody gets happy. We get happy early. But distinguishing the negative, even as a young teen, we're still learning some of that stuff. So a long time to really get to adult proficiency and then a lot of variation among adults. Several years after adoption, we know around age five, children who have come from institutions in Russia and Eastern Europe, this is work of Seth Pollack, have difficulty in identifying even, even peak emotions. And they have real difficulty in figuring out what emotion goes to what context. So a little kid who's lost their, their ice cream on the ground, what face what emotion face should go with that. They struggle with that. Jen is just publishing a paper, right, on eight-year-olds? Uh, of the kids from the Bucharest Early Intervention Project that suggests that by eight, after they've been out for longer, they're getting pretty good at that. They may not be able to do certain high comp, comp but everything you tried, am I right? Did I read your paper? Everything you tried, they were doing pretty good at, right? Pretty good. The foster. The foster kids had come back. So this may be an area that is either spared or can really come back. On the other hand, when we talk to parents of eight-year-olds who have adopted internationally, they're still telling us their kids have trouble interpreting the emotions and behavior of other kids. So it may be that in more complicated real-life circumstances they're struggling. And no surprise, if they're struggling with that, their parents say they sometimes have trouble being considerate of other people's feelings. They're probably still a bit confused or maybe a little behind their peers in the level that they should be at. Theory of mind. This is this perspective taking thing. It's called theory of mind. You, we develop our theories of people's, of our own mind and other people's mind, which is why it's labeled that way. This is the core deficit in autism. This may be why impacts on the development of the neural systems that are required for this kind of perspective taking may be why some children who come out of institutions become labeled as having autistic like features, one of the components. We do know that this is an area that is at least delayed and for some children post-institute is seriously impaired. We also see problems with this in kids growing up in their families of origin who have been severely neglected. Theory of mind. One of the tasks that we use for this is called the false belief task. So you're told a story, you see a story about a little boy who sees his mother baking a cake and um, something happens and I can't remember the whole, you can do it in many different ways. But he sees that, his sister doesn't see it, his sister comes in the room, you ask him what the sister knows. and. He, Young children, three and four year olds, think she'll know exactly what I know. She'll know that there is either, you know, something in the cake or where the cake got put or all the rest of that. By the time typically developing kids are five, they know she doesn't know squat because she wasn't there. 
And what we see for children from institutions that by age six, seven years of age, they're still performing like the four-year-olds. They're struggling to engage in this task. And others have seen this as well. The Rudder Group has seen it, even with kids who are on the cusp of adolescence, they're struggling with these theory of mind tasks. Now, theory of mind can be used for good or ill. You need to be good at this to be really good at deceiving other people. You need to be good at that to be really good at being socially cruel. Now you can lie and you can be socially cruel, but to be good at it, you have to get into other people's heads so you can manipulate their heads. It's also, of course, important to avoid it used so you can avoid being deceived yourself and being manipulated. And it's important skill to have if you really want to be empathetic and understand somebody who is different from you. So again, skill and competence, not necessarily making you a good or bad person is how you use it. Uh, but it's a skill you need if you're going to get into this complicated teen world, especially the teen girl world, really requires that. Understanding and appropriately negotiating social boundaries. This is the area that in post-institutionalized kids we call indiscriminate friendliness. Responding to friendly or neutral strangers as if they were your intimates, people you had known all your life. We know that it is neither completely indiscriminate, they pick out nice people, and it's not really friendly. They're not really interested in the other person. Um, this is the one that we believe that in institutions, kids developed as a really important way of getting their needs met. Anybody who comes into that unit, they're running up to mama, mama, mama is the heartbreakingest thing that ever happens to you, is walking into those places. Um, and they do get picked up, they're getting some social attention through this. So it's been argued that the reason we see this is because they've learned this behavior, and it may be true. But when we see kids who come out of institutions, a lot of them are showing it one or two months after getting to their family, and then it just drops off like a rock for most of them. By eight months post-adoption, we barely see any of it, except in some kids. And in those kids, it seems to stick around. We've been doing work on trying to identify, can we tell a difference in the behavior that would predict for us that these are the kids that might need intervention early? And we think we see it. It's the kids, I mean, kids, range in sociability, right? If I got a two-year-old in this in a room, she might be or he might be very friendly to me, talking at me, standing my mom's side or dad's side, yakety 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 talk, 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 or very shy. Normal range. We see a normal range in our post-institutionalized kids in that kind of behavior. What differs is the ones who go on touch. By 18 to 36 months, kids have learned the rule, you don't touch people you don't know. You don't climb in their lap, you don't swat them on the butt, you don't do those kinds of physical things. And the kids that we see seem to be keeping it are showing physical intimacy eight months post-adoption. So we're looking at cues for that. But most of the kids, it does resolve. We now know, and I think you maybe learned last year, this is one of the things that can get you identified as having an attachment disorder, a disinhibited attachment disorder. You go to a therapist, the kid's got some problems, they see that you're very, the baby the child is very friendly with the therapist even though they never met them, climb in the lap, they say clearly this child hasn't formed an attachment to you. Disinhibited attachment disorder. We now know from the Bucharest Project and from our own work, it's absolutely not true. That the development of attachment is something different from this indiscriminate stuff, whatever that is. And in fact, Charlie Zena, working on the new DSM manual, has taken disinhibited attachment out of the manual. It's gone, thrown, poof. And it is now labeled as a disorder of social approach or something. Independent of attachment. Critically important for all of you who are practitioners. There may be problems with attachment. We're gonna have to look at other measures to figure that out, okay? Because you can be securely attached and indiscriminately friendly at the same time. Um, okay, we do know that it's related to problems with cognitive inhibitory control. Things, cognitive inhibitory control is like playing red light, green light, or Simon Says, or other kind of cognitive tasks that require that you inhibit a prepotent mental or behavioral response. It correlated with that. We're thinking we should call it disinhibited social approach as a better term than indiscriminate friendliness. And as I said, it's not just about being more or less sociable, it's about these odd behaviors that we learn to in inhibit 
Hello, we learn to inhibit them under the normal course of development. Um, and it changes in form with development. Um, by the time you're getting to teenagers, the kids aren't coming up to strangers and climbing in their lap. But they're often coming up to them and talking to them about inappropriate things. Is that a baby in your belly? Um, it, sharing too much private information. I peed in my bed last night. Um, and pestering. They don't read the social cues. You know the fact you're picking up your papers as an indication we're done now. I'm your teacher. It's time for you to go sit down. And so the person has to say you must leave now. So they're not reading those social cues. It's a boundary issue. Uh, seems to be more than anything else. Okay, I better move on here. Um, anger and aggression. For a long time we thought if post-institutionalized kids were like kids who were in the foster care system who had been maltreated and neglected. One of their big problems should be externalizing behavior problems, aggression, conduct disorder, etc., etc. We know from the work of Mike Rutter and from our own work and a bit from the Bucharest Project, though they are saying a little bit different at age five, is that aggression and conduct problems are not the big problems of post-institutionalized kids. They're not the big problems either of kids in the foster care system if they get early into solid good families. Like the canary in the coal mine, in young children, pre-adolescent, these behaviors often reflect the fact that they're not getting well cared for and they're acting out as an expression of a need for a safer, more secure environment. So a powerful effect of getting into families is we don't see much of that behavior. They're not more aggressive with other kids. They're more victimized, but not more aggressive. Um, and they are, um, they're not stealing and do other, they may be stealing food. That may be a whole different issue about hoarding and things as something else. But they're not hanging out in little eight-year-old gangs, okay? If anything, they're the victim of the eight-year-old. The eight-year-olds were more bullyish. They do have problems with emotions, though. They tend to melt down when they're frustrated or they're intensely. So they have emotion regulatory problems surrounding anger, parents tell us. Not all of them. But if they have an issue, that's where it is. And they are more fearful. And the kids tell us this. Every time we try to measure it, PI kids come out explaining that they've got more anxieties and more fears. They're not necessarily telling their parents about these anxieties and fears. Many of them center around separation anxiety. Let me show you some data. These kids are eight and nine years of age. We've done interviews with them on their emotions and their feelings. This is sad and lonely feelings, a set of scales that score that, separation anxiety and general anxiety. There are three groups in this study. There are kids adopted from institutions. They're all adopted over 12 months of age and before five years of age, and they have to have spent 75% of their lives in institutions prior to adoption for us to call them PI kids, because we want to be looking at kids with a lot of that experience. We need an adoption comparison group. In so much of the work, there's no adoption comparison group. In the Bucharest problem, they have a care as usual group, a wonderful group for a comparison. But in many studies, it's just non-adopted kids. So we need an adoption comparison group. And for us, our comparison group are children adopted early under eight months of age from foster care overseas. So they've had a family environment, because that's really what I'm interested in looking at. Kids who have grown up with or without a family environment early in life. And then we do have a non-adopted comparison group. Their families are of the same education and income as the families who adopt internationally, because that describes the world these kids are going into and the kids these kids will be in school with. And what you're seeing here is that the post-institutionalized kids describe themselves as being significantly more sad and lonely, as experiencing more separation anxiety and more general anxiety. Now, if this was the parents' reports, I would see the same bars for the early adopted kids because parents who adopt seem to have radar out there worrying about their kids' anxieties and needs and seeing every little flick of anxiety and remembering it, okay? But the kids don't see that. They, they are like the kids who have been non-adopted um, and grown up. So we see this and almost every time we look at this from the kids' reports that the post-institutionalized kids have more anxiety. So, oops, move on. We'll get to a summary here. 
And by the way, I'm going to give Hal all these slides. The only ones he can't have to put up if you've got a website are the ones that have the data that hasn't been published yet. So I'll rip those out, but almost everything else you can have. Anxious children take few risks. So we might have hope that they're not going to go out and do anything really, really scary. But of course, early deprivation may make it harder for them to judge the risks. All the risk research that we know of in adolescence and in childhood, except for a few studies by Larry Steinberg, do not involve the child making decisions in the context of peers. That's the next horizon, and it may change the whole ball game. So what I'm going to talk about are risk-taking and sensation-seeking stuff without the peers around. All right? Keep that in mind. Uh, Risk-taking, though, does, in typical kids, increase in adolescence. So we want to know where are post-institutionalized kids before adolescence. I'm going to show you the results from two tasks, and I'm going to describe a general design right now, because we're going to come back and back and back to this as we get into the work on puberty. 12 and 13 year olds are really, really helpful if your interest is in what effect does puberty have on behavior. Because if you know, if you get a group of 12 and 13 year olds in a room, every stage of puberty will be represented, right? From all done to ain't thinking about it for years, right? So you get that huge range. And what taking kids who are just 12 and 13 years old, their social setting though, is all very much the same. So you can sort of control what their their world is, their school life, where they are, and get a range of pubertal outcomes. So that, we use that technique. It was developed by Ron Dahl down in Pittsburgh. It's really slick. Um, so this is studies of 12 and 13 year olds. We've contacted the families. We've identified kids that should be, you know, at the, this end of the pubertal spectrum and at this end. We bring them in. We verify it. They give us reports of where they are. Um, that's not as good as a nurse's exam, but this work was done before the grant, which I'm trying to get where I can do the nurse's exam. Um, so this is preliminary work, but it's been published. And we look at uh, two things, self-reports of sensation seeking. Now this is not things they've actually done. We're not asking for reports of risk taking. These are questions like, um, or statements like, I often think it would be fun to go skydiving. And if you go, holy no. No way do I think it would be fun. You would say no to that. Um, but um, I think it would be fun to um, spend time. I like to spend time, or I'd like to spend time with older kids. That's social sensation seeking. Questions like that. So it's what sounds good to them? What sounds rewarding? We looked at that. And then there's this thing called the BART. It's the balloon analog risk taking task. And it's a balloon that you push a button on. It blows up bigger and bigger. As it gets bigger and bigger, you get more and more points. These are real points you get to buy stuff or do stuff with later. But it pops at some point, and you don't know at what point. So if you're very cautious, you don't blow it up very much, and you take your little points. You never make much, but never lose much. Or if you're really risk taking, you blow it up a max, and you lose a lot of points, and you don't make much, and, and it, whatever. So it's a risk taking measure. These are the data from the study on the kids who are pre-early puberty. We're going to get to the pubertal stuff later in the talk. What you're seeing here is, these are their sensation-seeking scores. One set of questions on this has to do with drug and alcohol. Let me tell you, these kids are like, mm, doesn't sound good to me at all. I'm 12 and 13. My parents have raised me right. I ain't doing that. Of course, we don't know that they won't do it. They're just saying on this. Uh, so that's like zip. But we're getting data on, um, on uh, thrill and adventure seeking, skydiving sounds like a lot of fun, and social disinhibition. I would like to go out with older kids and do cool older kids stuff. I'd like to go on a date, that kind of stuff. Um, what you're seeing is our non-deprived kids are scoring higher, our non-adopteds, than our post-institutionalized kids. What we don't know is whether their fearfulness is reducing their interest in doing rewarding but high sensation thing, or whether actually their reward system is a little different. But we see it as being different here prior to puberty. Some very specific skills that potentially are trainable if we understand what's going on, that are needed for social competence, that are needed to regulate strong emotions, they are more anxious, and they're lower in risk taking and sensation seeking when we measure them prior to puberty. And then it happens. The best of times and the worst of times. Raise your hand if you thought teen years were just the best of time in your life. 
Some do. See? Raise your hand if it was excruciating and you took a bath when you turned 20 to wash the teen years off. <laughs> Still hoping to get beyond it. It's really tough. The teen years, the reason we're so concerned is it really becomes a challenge to navigate this world and to do so happily and productively. Many of us make it through more or less unscathed, but it's tough even for people with all their faculties intact. And if we come into this period with a little sputtering in some of these skill areas, it can be even potentially more challenging. We know from longitudinal studies, such as the ones that Mike Rutter did in, in the United Kingdom following those kids adopted from Romania, remember they came out of very severe deprivation, that we see an increase in depression in early adolescence. We see that for non-adopted kids as well. But in his study, the non-adopted kids and the kids adopted um, in the United Kingdom very early didn't show as much of an increase in that as the kids adopted out of the orphanages. So a bigger increase in depressive symptoms and in clinical depression and an increase in conduct disorder. Same pattern more for the PI kids than for the kids who had been adopted in the UK early, so they were in adoption control, or the non-adopted kids in there. Actually, he didn't have non-adopted kids. He only had the UK adoption control. The emergence of emotional and conduct problems they saw in some of the kids, even though they hadn't shown any problems earlier. So it was like a sudden emergence. And I'm sure if you've talked to many adoptive parents, this is the experience in adolescence. Everything's been going along pretty well. And then, Adolescence is, and suddenly we don't know what's gone, what, what happened to her. We just don't know what happened to her. It's overwhelming, or to him. The most vulnerable in that study were the youth who had problems with theory of mind, indiscriminate friendliness, and a little bit lower IQ prior to the teen years, raising that spectrum that if we could get in there and support the development of these things early, we might be able to really make the teen years much more navigable if we knew which kids we needed to work on and had good ways of doing this. This needs research. We don't really know how to do all of these things, but the hope is the more we understand, the better we can go after it. So finally, we are at what you came here for, which is adolescent brain development. And the human brain is not fully mature at adolescence. We know this now, very much so, that the adolescent years are years of continuing development of many regions in the brain. We're gonna talk about several areas in adolescent brain development that I think impact on what we understand for kids coming out of conditions of deprivation. One is decision making and self-control. We've been talking about this all along, but now we're going to talk about what we know about the brain regions that are involved in this. This is your prefrontal cortex up here. It's a wondrous part of our brain. And the dorsal part up here dorsal and lateral part is very important for all those kind of executive functions, working memory, cognitive control, planning, all those things that keep getting better as we get older until we get to about 25 and then, yeah. Um, the ventral, an area called the orbital region is important for sort of tagging events as being rewarding or positive or not. And you can't see it on the inside, the medial side. Talks a lot to the emotion centers of the brain. The way that regulation can happen is your reasoning part can talk to your emotion part which can regulate the limbic areas and that's one of the ways we think emotion regulation happens. But, so that's cognitive decision. We're now, the reason this looks fuzzy is it's, I, the brain should really be chopped in half and we should be looking inside at these things. We're now looking at the circuitry that we believe is involved in reward. The uh, nucleus accumbens, which is part of a region called the striatal region, is very sensitive to reward and tags events. It's where we get sort of that sense of things feeling really, really good. If you put electrodes down in that area, um, you'll get animals to want to stimulate themselves. Like, it just feels great. It's very involved in, if you read anything on addiction, You'll read a lot of research about the nucleus accumbens, but of course, nature did not put it in there so we could become addicted to drugs. This region is critically important so we can become really oriented towards the good things in life, so we can form attachments, so we can identify situations as having many good things for us, okay? 
And so we can tell our hippocampus to remember those good things and to remember the context in which we experience those good things. In the addiction research, this is why. When you walk, if you've given up smoking and you are doing great and then you walk into a place where you used to smoke, your memory just all is triggered about, and you're just like, oh my god, I want to smoke, I want to smoke. Okay, so talks to the hippocampus, retains the information about the context. Dopamine, my favorite neurotransmitter, I could live on dopamine, because it is part of all that reward system and focusing of attention. Um, a reward system that we're beginning to understand. Okay, it's on the inside there. If we look at adolescents, no surprise here, and we test them on tasks that require rational decision making and cognitive control, they get better and better and better at this across adolescents, right? They get better at these kinds of things. And if we look at the brain, we see that that should make sense. Because what we're seeing here is gray matter volume. Red is lots of it, and we get less. Remember I told you, you're proliferating, then you're pruning in these areas, those nerve cells. And if we look from age five, we see that actually you're beginning to get some pruning, getting bluer, we're into the teen years, you're not done, you're getting bluer, you're getting, you're pretty blue. You're pretty done with the pruning. So these regions, this dorsal and lateral regions, are getting more and more efficient at thinking and reasoning with adolescent development. Okay, step one. The reward system, however, might be doing something else. And this is a theory by B.J. Casey. It's accumulating evidence. The suggestion, the evidence is that that reward system goes through a temporary period of hyper activation. It revs up, maybe with pubertal hormones. We don't know the answer there. It Wow, things are things that weren't rewarding before are now really, really rewarding, and you get drug into potentially doing things for their reward value, and it outstrips your rational decision making. Which may be why very reasonable, rational teenagers can do really stupid things. <laughs> right? And some of those things can have very damn, I mean, if you live through these, you're going to be okay. If you live through these, you're already altering your brain and your body in very profound ways. So we worry a lot about this mismatch between the reward system and the rational decision making system in all the contexts <laughs> in which it is implied. Okay, got that? These are typically developing adolescents we're talking about now. The question will be how does the child who's coming into this with a sort of different set of neurobiology navigate this? And then I want to talk about fear and its regulation. How many of you just went, ugh? Right? You barely even knew what was up there. You went, ugh. That's your amygdala talking. It got the message really fast. You're a little spider phobic. And already you're going, ooh, backing up. Okay? Fear. That system is very, very important for triggering fear responses. It talks to other parts of the brain. It talks to your hippocampus. Remember those places that are threatening. And it interacts with your prefrontal cortex, um, sometimes hijacking your reasoning because you're so anxious. All you can do is look out for things that are scary. And sometimes requiring that reasoning in order to tell it to calm down. It's just a stupid picture. It's not going to get you. Okay? So. We don't know that the fear system really changes that much during adolescence. That hasn't really been the focus of much work. But we are very interested in how it may, sex hormones may reorganize how the amygdala is functioning and the kinds of things that it is processing, creating a little bit more of a female orientation versus a male orientation towards things, what is threatening and dangerous. Um, we also know that there's some major changes in the way the fear and uh, the stress system operates as we move into adolescence. So the amygdala is important in processing information about danger and threat in the environment and talking to the hypothalamus who talks to our adrenal glands causing them to produce cortisol which is a steroid stress hormone and adrenaline which is critically important and that's the va va voom sympathetic uh, neuro, neuro um, hormone. Adrenaline operates in the periphery, doesn't get in back into the brain. Cortisol 
feeds back all over the body, but also to the brain. It talks to the hypothalamus, turning itself off. Is this a condition that requires cortisol? Yes. Do you have enough? Yes. Okay. Got milk? Got milk. And to the amygdala, but here it's a more of a feed-forward system. So if you've activated this hormone intensely at the level of the amygdala, if that happens a lot, you're beginning to lower the threshold in which you will react to threat and danger. So if things are really bad and stressful, good thing, you want to amp up. What happens with adolescents, and we don't understand how this is maybe working with our friend the amygdala, is that the HPA axis, the one that produces cortisol, has been responsive during development, but it gets more responsive as we move into adolescence. So one of the best ways to jack up your HPA axis, if you don't give speeches all the time, is to have someone do public speaking and mental arithmetic in front of an audience and be judged and told they're making mistakes. Okay? Um, if we, it's called the Trier Social Stress Test. If we test children who are the same age but are early in puberty, we see a response, but it isn't enormous, as they, the ones in puberty are showing a bigger response. It's as if what pubertal hormones are doing is bringing the system online, activating it to respond more. Why? It's beginning to respond like an adult. Probably because, I think, because adults in our world are the ones who protect children from danger. Children have one job, go to the adults. If you've got an adult, that's all you need to do. You don't need to bring on this big system. If you're an adult, you have to take care of the world. So you're beginning to shift the whole stress system towards the mode it will have to be in to be in a confident adult. That's my theory, but I have, you know, I have no proof for it. Okay, last, the emerging, and this unfortunately won't be all that long, the emerging work on neurobehavioral development and puberty in kids who have come out of conditions of deprivation. We've been doing uh, imaging studies, as has the Bucharest Project, on uh, children who grew up in institutions and then, for us, moved into families. These data come from children who are 12 and 13 years of age. This is not a study of puberty, although we have pubertal information. We haven't looked at it yet. Uh, what we have here are kids who were born and raised in Minnesota, kids who were adopted under 12 months of age from all over the world, and kids who were adopted over 12 months of age from all over the world, but before five. And what we've done is we've been imaging here the prefrontal cortex relative to the size of the rest of the brain. And what you can see is that we have a smaller volume. There's been more pruning, perhaps more cell loss in the prefrontal cortex prior to the time you start really pruning this area. And I believe that the Bucharest Project has seen similar things, um, right? Yes, similar things. This reduction in brain volume. The prefrontal cortex, even though it develops late, seems to be very strongly affected by early deprivation. We see this for kids who are coming up in their families of origin and are experiencing neglect. It's exactly the region of the brain that deals with all of those social skills that I talked to you about. So it's no surprise that we're seeing this. There's, of course, individual variation, okay, even though the means look quite strikingly different, and they are. What about fear in our friend the amygdala? These are data from children who are 9 to 18 years of age, not from our lab. This is from uh, Danny Pine and um, Mary Dozier's work. Um, this is neuroimaging of these children. What they're asked to do is to look at faces expressing different emotions. This obviously is what? Fear. Thank you. Um, and they're told, on some runs, they're told to measure, to think about how wide the nose is. They're measuring the width of the nose. So a cold cognitive task. On others, they're asked to, how does this face make you feel? And they say angry, uh, fear, neutral, and sad faces. And what they're looking at is how much does that amygdala, that emotion center, light up? How much blood is it requiring? Which is an indication of how much activity it's engaging in. And what they see in this study is um, comparison youth. And these are kids with a history of deprivation. They either come from orphanages overseas or they're neglected in their families of origin. So it's a mixed group. And what they see is for both angry faces and fearful faces, the threatening faces, the children who have had deprivation early in their histories, they're 9 to 18 now, well beyond that, 
the amygdala is acting up more. It's lighting up more. It's detecting it more. So here these kids are in adolescence, at least it, but it's a very small study. It's a very small study. We don't know what, and it's just once. We don't know what changes we could see. But it's consistent with kids saying they're more anxious. This is a study, also not mine, um, by the Rudder Group, looking at some of those children adopted from Romanian orphanages. And here what they're looking at is the reward system in the brain, those, that nucleus accumbens business that I showed you. The task is called a monetary incentive delay task. All this basically is, is on an, you're, you're supposed to push a button as quickly as possible when you know the stimulus comes up. On some trials you don't make much money at all, on others you're going to make a lot, and that signal to you how much money you're going to get on that trial. So on tiles where you're going to get a big amount of money, you're a little faster in pushing the button, but your reward center says, whoop de doo get making 20 bucks on this one, right? And it lights up. That's the concept. You're seeing it lit up here in these regions, but these are for the comparison kids. When they ran, and they're li this is a comparison of trials with money and all this incentive delay versus trials where you're not getting anything. So it's a comparison always in these. These are the comparison kids. When they ran the kids who came from the Romanian orphanages, no difference no difference, no response of the system. As if it was hypo response to reward, which by the way would be consistent with our sensation seeking data too. Sunuga Barker, who as studies ADHD, argues that one pathway to it is not to be able to link reward with outcome so that you guide your attention and your focus. So this is sort of consistent with his ADHD theory. But it may also send kids into adolescence needing to do bigger things in order to experience reward. That's the deep concern. It's not that you can't experience, but you need to do bigger stuff. Just knowing you're getting X isn't enough. It might take drugs the first time you experience them, oh wow, finally I feel good, I've never felt good before. Alcohol, all those things. That's one of the uh, worries with this and addiction, hypo-responsiveness. We don't know though. What happened to our kids? As they went into adolescence, this is back to that study where I showed you the early pre-stuff before. The kids, same age, who were just mid-late puberty, are not looking any different though. They've started to really mirror what's happening to children who are non-adopted. Now I have to tell you in this study, we carefully selected for kids who did not have emotional and behavioral problems because we wanted to see what happened with puberty with a history of deprivation in the absence of serious problems. So prior to puberty, we saw the effect. The kids who were pubertal, now they looked like non-adopted kids. There's a possibility that for some of these kids, especially those who are doing well and not experiencing a lot of stress, that they've got an opportunity to reorganize. The BART, however, tells me that it's not working there because there you can see what happens to our non-adopted kids. They're showing an increase in risk-taking with puberty, even though they're the same age. We aren't seeing much of that in our PI kids. So this is real research. You can tell because it doesn't tell a coherent story yet. Nature has tricks up her sleeve that we still have to figure out. Back very briefly to this whole issue of a changing activity of the stress system with puberty. These are typically developing kids. This is Laura Stroud's data to show you that not just me, Laura also finds that when you do that speech task, whoopsie do, when you do that speech task, if you're pubertal, you show a bigger response than if you're a younger child. And she has this great peer rejection stressor um, that she uses. And we can see that, yes, adolescents show a bigger hormonal stress response to that than do children. So the HPA axis, more stress hormone, potentially putting kids at risk if things are bad for developing fears, anxieties, and depression. That's the theory. But also, obviously, nature needed it to be happening. When we look at children adopted from conditions of deprivation, if the deprivation has been severe, we see a shift in the functioning, the amount of cortisol those kids are producing, even under non-risk conditions. This is data that we have on kids adopted from Romania into British Columbia. 
These kids were the green ones, the yellow ones were adopted under four months of age. The green ones are Canadian kids growing up in their families of origin. So it's not just coming out of a Romanian orphanage. It's coming out and getting to a family at eight months or later that seem to be raising their average levels of cortisol. Now, I've done a lot of this. The later information is a little more confusing. Some kids look like they're elevated and some kids look like they're actually low. So we've been trying to figure out, and Dana's been helping us figure out what might be going on, and the place we went wandering was in growth delay. And the reason we wandered in growth delay, because kids vary in how stunted their growth is as an adoption, is that we think most of that delay in many kids is not about malnutrition. It's about the stress system talking to the growth system. Because the way we have evolved is if you are under chronic stress, you want to keep your energy for dealing with threat. And you don't put your energy into things you can do later, like grow or repair. Okay? So there's a, me let me talk to you about your growth system. This is how your growth system works. You've got in your uh, hypothalamus region that's going to produce growth hormone actually produces more of it at night, so kids do grow overnight an inch sometimes, maybe it seems like. That talks to your liver that produces this thing called insulin-like growth factor one, that talks to the bone plates and gets your bones to grow longer, and talks to your muscles and helps you develop strong muscles. There's two things that control this. There's a releasing hormone that steps on the gas, and there's this thing called somatostatin that steps on the brake. And it plays this sort of gas brake kind of thing in terms of producing the growth hormone. Corticotropin releasing hormone that starts the cascade to produce cortisol talks to somatostatin and chunks it up. It pushes on the brake up in the hypothalamus to reduce growth hormone production. Cortisol interacts at the level of the uh, liver to reduce the liver's sensitivity to growth hormone. So at two levels, your stress system can turn down your growth system, presumably produce, preserving energy to deal with infections or other things that might be happening to you. So we think that in many kids, the growth, stunted growth we see at adoption is a reflection of the chronic exposure to chronic stress. So we began to look at growth as an index of potentially how stressed the child had been pre-adoption. And what we began to see there was that the children who had been stunted at adoption and grown rapidly thereafter were producing way more of that hormone than the average kid. And the ones who hadn't were actually low in hormone. So we've been tracking that. But notice in this study, I'm sorry, I am almost done. You'll have time to ask questions. The kids are 9 to 11 years of age. They're prepubertal. Almost all of them were prepubertal. We still don't know what happens at puberty, but we have a hypothesis. And we call this the pubertal stress recalibration hypothesis. The idea here, and I hate to keep turning away from you, um, but I'm going to have to, is Let's start down here. This is brain development, neuronal development, probably of the hypothalamus, really focusing on that. Early in life, there's a period of intense plasticity where what you experience gets embedded here and biases the system towards anticipating harshness or more benign conditions. If you grow up in harsh conditions, that gets embedded here and we produce sort of a more hyper-responsive system. Then there's this period of stability after this early period where the system doesn't change and then we think with puberty you open up another period of plasticity and then we become more stable. If you're under harsh conditions here, you get set for that. You retain that for a long time till puberty. If you're under benign conditions, if you're not dealing with psychosocial stress, you reset to that level. If you are, you may be become even more hyper. That's the theory. Looking at those children who did not have emotional and behavior problems, we looked at one aspect of the system, which is this response to waking up in the morning. And yes, nature knows that life is stressful, so you do activate the system first thing in the morning. The early pre-kids, if we look at abnormality in that response, the PI kids showed a lot more abnormality than the non-adopted kids. But the kids who had gone through puberty looked just like my non-adopted kids. They had, had re potentially recalibrated. We're looking, we're out at, tell NIH, give us the money we need to re, I mean, that's the grant we have going right now. 
So the teen years can be the best of times and the worst of times. Our thought is that it gives an opportunity to recalibrate. But your experiences during your teen years can either be very stressful or they can be pretty good. We have a window of opportunity as kids move towards the idea is a window of opportunity as kids move towards those teenage years to help them with the skills they're going to need to navigate those years in a way that will be low in stress so that they can recalibrate their system to a more typical low stress condition. And if not, they may be experiencing loads of stress and we may get a hyper-responsive system. So that's the concept. I don't think I need to summarize all of this because I think you might have it or I'll leave it up here and you can look at it. I'll come back to it. There are loads of people to thank. I won't go through those. You can see them on the thing. And I think I'll give you a few minutes now to ask me some questions. Sorry it took so long.